Hello, and welcome back for another installment of Spiritual Insights. What do you think the U.S. Navy would have done if it had known about the secret Japanese plan to attack Pearl Harbor in 1941? Although the Navy had some inklings that something was coming, they didn't know exactly when and where. And then, of course, we all know what happened on that day of infamy. Or what do you think the CIA, the FBI, and the NSA would have done if they had known that the 9-11 attacks were being planned. They had picked up internet chatter and had reason to believe that something was afoot. They just didn't know exactly when and where or how. And then, of course, we all know what happened on that fateful day. By its nature, deception is advantageous to the first mover. The ancient Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu put it like this, quote, All warfare is based on deception. Hence, when we are able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must appear inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near." Unquote. I think most of us would agree that there is a culture war raging right now, and all of us are combatants, wittingly or unwittingly, willingly or unwillingly. And this, lar this war largely broke out in the mid-20th century, and many of us alive today grew up in it. It is largely a civil war among us who live within the framework of the Western world. We all bear its scars, especially spiritually, and this war is raging right now, the culture war. In this culture war, there had been no obvious Pearl Harbors or 9-11s, they would compel all Americans to rally around the flag. Rather, it's been more of a, a low-level escalation over many years, so gradual that many of us don't even realize that we've been engaged in this conflict at least since the 1960s. You know, the analogy of the frog in boiling water comes to mind. Consequently, some Christians don't realize that their values have already been suppressed. Some Christians fall into the trap of calling for peace when the other side has no such interest. Some Christians don't want to be bothered in, in engaging in this war because they don't want to get out of their comfort zone. And then some Christians think that the culture war has already been hopelessly lost. But the reality is all is not lost. In fact, despite all of the recent setbacks, battles can still be won. And victorious battles lead to victorious wars and eventually an end to the conflict. And so with that in mind, I'd like to share with you a short excerpt from the book, How to Win the Culture War, A Christian Battle Plan for a Society in Crisis by Dr. Peter Kreeft. It, it looks like it's Kreeft, but it's actually spelled Kreeft. It's a very short book, only about 120 pages, but it's a very practical guide that shows how this, this war can be fought and won. And honestly, the first step is simply to acknowledge that the war has already been declared by, Pope, by what Pope John Paul II has called the culture of death. Whether we believe it or not, this war has already been declared and we're all involved in it. And so before the actual reading, let's take a moment now to pray. In the Father, and the Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. O Holy Ghost, I beseech thee to enlighten my understanding. Give me a diligent and docile spirit. Give, give me a desire to apply what I read for the glory of God, for the sanctification of my soul, and for the salvation of others. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. And this excerpt is from the introduction of the book. There is one thing that almost everybody in America agrees about. Liberals and conservatives, rich and poor, atheists and theists, labor and management, women and men, gay and straight, pro-life and pro-choice, capitalists and socialists, just about everybody with a nose agrees that our culture is in what, is in what one president called deep doo-doo. Different groups have different explanations for the problem. Conservatives blame liberals and liberals blame conservatives. Straits blame gays, and gays blame straights. Whites blame blacks, and blacks blame whites. 
Men blame women, and women blame men. Some say that there's no one to blame, that it just happens. That's the purest pessimism of all. It means that there's nothing anybody can do about it. So America is doomed, for if nobody broke America, nobody can fix it. If there's no cause, there's no cure. Americans have never believed that before, except for Stoics, Fatalists, Calvinists, and Boston Red Sox. Definition of a Red Sox fan, someone who comes to opening day with a sign that says, wait till next year. Most Americans have always thought that human problems have human causes and human solutions, at least these kinds of problems. What kinds? Polls keep showing that the problems most Americans worry most deeply about are not political or economic, but social issues, cultural issues, in fact, moral issues. These are the issues that most directly affect the lives of ordinary people and families. Drugs, terrorism, divorce, homelessness, rape, alcoholism, violence, child abuse, abortion, the destruction of families, teen pregnancies, AIDS, suicide. We're more worried about our wrongs than our rights. This is obvious to anyone but an academic. How could a mother be more concerned with the gross national product than with whether her daughter is going to be raped. No wonder we're having fewer children who wants to bring babies into a battlefield, only the heroic or the naive. Nobody makes a TV show about kids with a title like Happy Days. The 50s were far from utopia, but we all know they were significantly happier than today. At this point, someone will respond by quoting the ultimate law of life. Ah, but you can't turn back the clock. You can't go home again. You can't stop progress. Yes, you can. This ultimate law is a lie. You can turn a clock back, both literally and figuratively. And you'd better, if the clock is keeping bad time. A clock or a society is a man-made invention. It doesn't just happen like the weather. We invented it. We can break it, and we can fix it. We can stop this false God progress, but instead we have stopped real progress. Real progress means getting closer to your goal, and the goal of every human being is happiness. Whatever we do, we do it to obtain some kind of happiness. And since we are no longer in happy days, it logically follows that we have stopped progressing by the most universal definition of progress, progress toward happiness. We have regressed. So when people today with glum, stoical faces say, you can't stop progress, they really mean exactly the opposite. You can't stop regress. I say you can, and I want to tell you how. But first, who am I to tell you? I am not a sociologist. I am not an expert in anything. What qualifies me to write this book then? Precisely that, that I am not an expert. It is the experts who are the problem. And it's the rest of us who still rely on common sense who can solve them. Common sense means the practical sense that is common to everybody except the experts. It is high time for us non-experts, us amateurs, to take over. It's, how, it's high time for our democracy to become democratic. To do that, we need to do something truly radical, but it won't cost a cent or a drop of blood. We need to ignore the experts and listen to common sense instead. That will make the experts really mad. Experts can't stand to be ignored. In fact, this book will offend many people. For the same reason, it will delight many others. Because it is not only about a war, a culture war, a spiritual war, a jihad, but it is itself an act of war. It will thus offend two kinds of people. First, it will offend the experts. It's already done that. Second, it will offend people who hate to be told that there is a war. These are terribly nice people. Canadians, for instance. This book will probably be censored in Canada as hate speech, like Dr. Laura, and be confiscated at the border. It is loud and crude, and I'm not sorry. For it is written on a battlefield in the heat of battle. It is written for soldiers or potential soldiers enlistees. 
It is therefore not a carefully researched, beautifully nuanced, politically academic argument. It is not a sweet violin. It is an ugly, blaring trumpet. On a battlefield, a trumpet works better than a violin. Here is a preview and summary of this book in one page. To win any war, any kind of war, the nine most necessary things to know are the following. Number one, that you are at war. Number two, who your enemy is. Number three, what kind of war you are in. Number four, what the basic principle of this kind of war is. Number five, what the enemy's strategy is. Number six, where the main battlefield is. Number seven, what weapon will defeat the enemy. Number eight, how to acquire this weapon. And number nine, why you will win. However, we can never win this war if, number one, you blissfully sow peace banners on a battlefield. Number two, if you do not know whom you are fighting. Number three, if you do not know what kind of war you are fighting. Number four, if you do not know the basic rules of battle. Number five, if you do not know your enemy's battle plan. Number six, if you send your troops to the wrong battlefield. Number seven, if you use the wrong weapons. Number eight, if you do not know how to get the right weapon. Number nine, if you are not confident of your inevitable victory. This little book is a basic nine-point checklist to be sure we know this minimum, at least. It is a wake-up call. Well, I hope that this has intrigued you to read the entire book. Again, it's called How to Win the Culture War by Dr. Peter Kraft. And the subtitle is A Christian Battle Plan for a Society in Crisis. I actually read this book as a seminary project, and I highly recommend it. Uh, Dr. Peter Kraft, um, he, he actually uh, gives, should give himself a little bit more credit. He is now a retired uh, philosophy professor of many years from Boston College, a, uh, a Catholic college, Catholic university. And so as always, I thank you for listening today and I'd love to read your thoughts and on this topic in the comments section below. And let us now close with prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Grant, O my Jesus, that like thy blessed mother, that we may cherish all thy words, pondering them in our hearts. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make a shine, may his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God be with you all.